从核物理学家到伊核谈判桌上的关键人物，他是奥巴马政府的秘密武器。Who is Japan? Are you happy with the results of the deal? I'm very happy、uh, with it. If you really have such a clear goal, then how come it took so many years for this deal to be reached? 重返游氏的伊朗宣称将失地不得。That's up to them to discuss with OPEC. But the key is actually the key is look in OPEC. Obviously, Saudi Arabia is a major player. 清洁能源是否真的清洁？专访美国能源部部长欧内斯特·莫尼兹。大家好，欢迎收看《风云对话》，我是小田。今天我们的这位采访嘉宾是美国的能源部长。穆尼兹，其实，在见到穆尼兹以前，就对这位人物不陌生。有人介绍他说是奥巴马的秘密武器，也有人调侃他是白宫里的爱因斯坦。总之，这些头衔都与他过去几十年里的核物理学术背景不无关系。然而，穆尼兹还有一点被人称道的。是他的沟通技能和亲和力，这一能力更是在过去的伊核谈判过程中得以充分展现。美国核物理学家、政府内阁成员、重要国际议题上的谈判高手，能同时拥有这几个头衔的人不多。那么，今天我们就要来看看这位与众不同的美国能源部长——穆尼兹。欧内斯特·莫尼兹，科学家出身的技术专家，自2013年5月起任美国能源部部长。莫尼兹不仅在技术研究领域颇有建树，在政界也胜出一筹。被任命时，他以97票赞成、零票反对获得了参议院同意。因为帮助奥巴马搞定了伊朗核协议，去年莫尼兹成为内阁新星。So good afternoon, Secretary Moniz. Thank you very much for coming to our program. So I know that people call you the secret weapon of Barack Obama's administration. You were, I mean, the professor in MIT in Cambridge, in United States, for many many years, and then you became the cabinet member of the government. So, if we look back in the last four five years, what would you say is the thing that you feel the most proud of as Energy Secretary of United States? Well, there are actually several issues because the Department of Energy has many, many、uh, roles.、Uh, certainly, in the clean energy arena, the Paris Agreement last year was, of course, a major accomplishment, and for the whole world, and China and the United States working together was absolutely critical. But running up to that, and this is where I was very heavily involved, was bringing innovation,、uh, technology innovation,、uh, to the forefront as a major tool、uh, for the world to address climate change. Uh, and then we、uh, started something called Mission Innovation,、uh, with 20 countries、uh, now with the EU as well.、Uh, and I believe this is going to, over time,、uh, prove to be、uh, one of the major、uh, ways in which the world will be able to achieve its climate goals.、Uh, so that's、uh, one thing that I'm very pleased about. Yeah, you're you're talking about the Mission Innovation. Yes, the Mission Innovation, right? Right. But if I go back to your first question, I would just say a second issue is、uh, clearly the. Uh, getting to the place we are、uh, on the nuclear arrangements with Iran、uh, has been uh, obviously a, a very、uh, was very important, I think, and、uh, and hopefully will become even more important. Yes,、uh, we noticed that you had a very important role in the、uh, nuclear talk with Iran. So the question is, to which extent are you happy with the result of the deal? I'm very happy、uh, with it.、Uh, again, the、uh, the objective of the、uh, negotiation. Was plain and simple. It was to reduce substantially the Iranian nuclear program and to bring a transparency and a verification、uh, from the international community to rest assured that they were not building a、But、nuclear weapon. But there's voice, especially from inside America, saying that America made a huge compromise in order to make this deal reached. Do you agree with that? Well, no. Again, the the、uh, the the voice. Those voices are often. Talking about what was not negotiated, this was a negotiation about nuclear weapons. It was not a negotiation about other issues、uh, with which we have problems: missile tests, support for terrorism, etc. The idea here was take the biggest problem off the table. We have done that, and in return, Iran gets some economic relief. So that was that was the agreement, and、uh, the IAEA, the international inspectors, have now issued two reports. And both reports say that Iran is following the agreement. If you really have such a clear goal, then how come it took so many years for this deal to be reached? You know, because the voice from the Iranian side, when we ask this question, we say, "What is the reason that it took so long?" And the answer, you know, what is very simple. 
They said, that's because of America. They're never consistent. They change their standards. Is it true? Well, no, I don't agree at all uh, with that. I think, again, here uh, in this negotiation, uh, which was going on for years uh, without making uh, adequate progress, uh, the, uh, it takes a long time for two countries, uh, let's face it, that don't start with any real amount of trust. And so it took a long time, and finally, uh, early in 2015, uh, then uh, the Iranian head of the nuclear program was brought in to negotiate alongside the foreign minister. I was brought in on the American side to negotiate alongside our foreign minister or secretary of state. And, um, and I think then things uh, began to, uh, to move forward. And uh, now I think uh, uh, Iran is complying with the deal. We are complying with the deal. And, and by we... And they are helping buying the heavy water from Iran. Uh, for example, correct, uh, and, but it's not only the United States, it's also Russia has been very cooperative in terms of uh, moving some things out of Iran and supplying. How about China? Uh, China is being, yes, and uh, China and the United States co-chair a working group of the negotiators, the P5 plus one, uh, that is working with Iran to redesign their research reactor. And we've, in fact, I met here in Beijing in March on that issue. So uh, all, uh, many of the countries are, we're all pitching in in our way to help the deal move forward. And, uh, and Iran is doing its part as well. Sardinisness下半年,国际油价走低以来,石油价格如坐过山车般经历巨大活动。布伦特原油价格从高点116美元每桶,到今年年初跌破30美元每桶。目前,石油输出国组织仍将继续保持高产政策。不过,受低油价
，核能是人类最具希望的未来能源之一，既能提供经济可靠的电力，又能应对气候变化问题。美国是全世界最早开始利用核能的国家，其核电发电量排名全球第一。目前，美国有九十九台在运核电机组，分布于三十个州。核能发电量占全国总发电量的百分之十九，并占低碳排放能源总发电量的百分之六十三，位居第一。So you yourself for、um, nuclear scientists. So when it comes to nuclear plants, nuclear energy, there's a technical issue that some of the nuclear plants in America they're facing a problem of aging. And some of them will have to be closed down within a decade. So what's next? Well, uh, first of all, most of the nuclear power plants in the United States uh, uh, have extended their 40-year license period for an additional 20 years. So uh, the major, the major retirements. We have uh, about 100 reactors that are operating right now. Uh, the major retirements would be in the 1930s. Uh, if they're not if they're not replaced or if they're not extended for 20 more years now uh, we recently have had um, a handful of plants uh, closed down before their life was uh, was ended and that was for competitive reasons in certain parts of the country where the very low natural gas price has uh, has undercut the economics. So it's a market reason. It's not right. so because of the concern of the safety. Correct. It's it's not. It was it was not a policy issue. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uh, on the other hand, you should also recognize that uh, right now there is a new nuclear reactor coming online. Uh, it will be fully operational probably in July or August, uh, and uh, we have four more uh, new ones. Uh, AP one thousands. They're called. Uh, the same design as is being built now in China. Mm -hmm. uh, we have four of those that will come online between 2018 and 2020. So right now we are building some new power plants, but some of the old ones are, are, uh, are going offline. 在美国总统奥巴马签署的二零一六财年综合拨款法案中，将为能源部的核能计划提供九点八六亿美元，比能源部的预算申请额高八千万美元。其中就有为先进反应堆概念的研发所提供的拨款和为核电厂二次焕发许可证，从而延寿的法案事项。奥巴马政府对核能发展的重视程度可见一斑。When people are talking about the future of the energy situation. There's a popular word that is a trilemma, meaning the energy security, energy accessibility, and the environment sustainability. So as the energy sector of the United States, do you have insights as for how to unlock this trilemma? Well, first of all, uh, I think we have to recognize that uh, the so-called clean energy technology revolution is underway. Uh, I mention that now because all of the trilemma uh, if you like, uh, is addressed uh, with the new clean energy technologies. The costs are coming down uh, for many of those technologies very dramatically, uh, and you see the result in the United States and China and elsewhere in terms of renewable growth and the like. Uh, I might note that many said when uh, oil prices were so low, it's going to stop the development of renewable energy, for example. It has not. Uh, in the United States, in fact, the low oil and natural gas prices have affected coal and nuclear and not so much renewables, which are growing very, very rapidly. A renewable technology, for example, or energy efficiency addresses all of the concerns. It's good for energy security, it's good for addressing climate, uh, it's, uh, it's good in all, in all dimensions, but we must keep innovating to drive the cost down. So that's really, that's really our focus. Well, please correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, there is another saying that the seemingly clean energy probably is not that clean uh, after all. For example, the solar panel or you see the uh, Lyon battery, the production of all these things is not really environmentally friendly. Uh, look, in obviously any manufacturing process is going to produce some forms of waste, etc. But right now, in the climate challenge, what we're focusing on is what we're doing to the, to the atmosphere, basically. The reality is that the atmosphere, you know, is, is, 
this, this will sound obvious. It's very critical <laughs> to our life on Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, now, obviously, we breathe the air, but what I mean is also the natural greenhouse effect from the atmosphere uh, warms the Earth by about 50 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. In other words, we would not have a habitable Earth without the greenhouse effect of the atmosphere. The point of that, however, is that if we mess with the atmosphere even a little bit, it can shift the temperatures by five degrees, for example, six degrees, and that's too much. Mm -hmm. That's why we must try to keep uh, the global warming below two degrees centigrade, mm -hmm. so about four degrees Fahrenheit, let's say, uh, in order not to have tremendous disruptions of all of our ecosystems uh, of, uh, of our environment. So that, that's really what's happening. Now, in doing that, it's also the case that we need to reduce the environmental footprint of production, whether it's production of natural gas or production of a solar panel. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our modern technologies, our, our clean energy technologies, uh, require rare elements mm -hmm. from the Earth's crust. They must be mined. So clearly there are a lot of environmental footprint issues that we need to, to work to reduce. But right now we are looking at the major threat of putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, and, that's, and, and we, must, we must reduce that. Right, so, so there's a procedure and a priority in this whole mission. Well, yeah, that means because there are very, di very different environmental impacts. The other, Im the impacts, uh, I'm not minimizing them in any way, uh, but the impacts of uh, resource extraction from the ground, for example, is a local environmental impact, and we must address it, whereas the global warming is a global impact. Mm -hmm. uh, so we all contribute to it, we all suffer from it uh, in the same way, and we all must work together uh, to, uh, to keep that greenhouse gas concentration as low as we can. This <laughs> So you are here this time in Beijing for the G20 Energy Ministerial meeting. So uh, how do you think of this meeting so far? What's your expectations for this meeting and what is going to be your input? to this uh, in important international event? Well, the G20 uh, meeting is uh, one of several meetings that different sets of countries have had uh, now in these last few months. Very importantly, the first after Paris. So now our focus is shifting from uh, an up to Paris. It was, how do we make Paris happen? Mm. Now it's, how do we implement it? How do we all reach our goals? So the focus now turns much more towards the kinds of policies and technologies uh, that we need in our countries uh, to, to meet the goals. So for example, energy efficiency is a, is a major challenge. I might add, by the way, that while I'm here, it's for the G20, but it's also our annual review of what's called the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center. This is about technology development that the U.S. and China are doing together to, to address these, these technologies. But another focus of the G20 this year in China has taken this as a, as a particular theme, uh, in addition to our themes of new technology and new efficiency, and that is access. Uh, over these last years, there's been a lot of discussion and programs uh, to bring energy, bring electricity to those in often rural situations who don't have adequate energy. In this meeting, it's bringing that theme of access also to the Asia-Pacific region mm. uh, because there are certainly many in the Asia-Pacific region also without access, probably 500 million people without access to uh, significant energy. So China has brought this uh, as, as a focus and it's going to uh, have us working together uh, to, to address these challenges. We do some of that now in India. We, the uh, Department of Energy in the United States, we do some of that in Indonesia. But the G20 now will have a much more powerful, I think, approach uh, to access, energy access uh, in the Asia-Pacific region.
。二零一五年，中美大事件之一，少不了习近平主席九月的访美。而随习主席一同出访的十五名中国企业家，涉及互联网、能源、金融三大领域，不难看出，这三项将是未来中美经贸合作的重头戏。目前，中美两国已经在能源领域取得实质性合作成果，尤其是近几年，两国在应对气候变化领域频繁合作，成为进度缓慢的全球气候谈判进程中为数不多的亮点。As for how to enhance the cooperation in energy sector between China and America, well, first of all, let me say it has been enhanced very dramatically in the last few years already, um, and uh, President Obama and President Xi uh, have shown uh, joint leadership uh, on on this issue, and that is absolutely central. Frankly, I think it was the President Xi, President Obama announcement in Beijing. Uh, in 2014, um, uh, November 2014, I believe, uh, that changed the whole game uh, going to Paris. Uh, I, I think it's really, it was a, it was a sea change. Uh, so uh, in terms of the direct collaboration, we are collaborating on mission innovation. We are collaborating uh, in uh, the G20 context. Uh, we are advancing our joint technology work in multiple directions, uh, clean vehicles, efficient buildings, carbon dioxide capture uh, from coal plants or industrial plants. We are now extending it to water, the energy water problems that, that we both face. And we are extending it, something that was discussed here at the G20 as well, is we are discussing about working together in improving the efficiency and lowering the pollution from heavy trucks, mm. which is a big problem in many, many countries. Uh, and of course, in addition to greenhouse gas emissions, it contributes a lot of local pollution, damages health of our citizens. So the heavy truck uh, program is going to be an another very, very important one. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's very encouraging, and, and I think the United States and China showing leadership really uh, has major influence across the world. 与穆尼兹的对话总体感觉很轻松，尽管涉及的话题其实大都较为沉重。穆尼兹部长说，他过去几年的政绩中最感满意的是清洁能源的发展以及伊朗和谈。我问他对这次伊朗和谈有多满意，有没有觉得美国做了太大让步？他说完全不会，因为和谈的目的很清晰，就是制止伊朗发展核武器。在说到清洁能源问题的时候，问他是否清洁能源真的清洁？这本是一个技术问题。然而，穆尼兹部长用宏观的政治角度做了回应。他说：“他相信任何事情都需要时间和过程。然而，保护环境的目的以及需求不会改变。”感谢收看本期节目，我们下周见。